My name is Kenneth Pulse, and I'm a member of the University of California, Berkeley, Emeriti Academy. Along with my colleagues, Professors Phil Cowan, Robin Flagg, Michael Harris, Steve Siegel, and Stephen Shortell, we have organized what we hope will be an interesting and informative discussion on challenges and opportunities facing California healthcare. We've selected three speakers who have had many years of experience with California healthcare policy and who will provide us with an overall view of some of the critical issues facing our state. Going forward, we hope to offer future webinars that will be focused on specific issues that will be raised in today's discussion. While we're waiting a few minutes for all our registrants to log in, I want to give you just a very brief history of the Berkeley Emeriti Academy. Currently, there are about 300 active Emeriti on the Berkeley campus. Until most recently, most have worked independently, making exceptional contributions to the campus. In the spirit of continuing to give back to Berkeley, a group of Emeriti began developing a new pathway that would encourage Emeriti from different disciplines to work together and that through these types of collaborative efforts, it would be possible to make unique and valuable contributions to the campus. This concept of interdisciplinary collaboration among Emeriti served as the background for the formation of the UC Berkeley Emeriti Academy, which was launched in late 2020. The Academy's mission is to facilitate creative projects and collaborations among Emeriti from different disciplines and perspectives. It encourages new and intellectual engagement, bringing together two or more Emeriti with different perspectives. Today's panel on the future of California healthcare is a direct outcome of the Academy. We have organized what we believe is a timely and important discussion on California healthcare. We hope you agree. It's now my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Robin Flagg. Uh, Robin completed her baccalaureate at Williams College in the mid 80s and then joined the Peace Corps and went to Nepal where she spent three years in a remote village teaching English to young children and introducing health programs for leaders, teachers, and students. Upon returning from Nepal, Robin began to work in health policy development advocacy with an advocacy with a number of organizations, including the California Association of Public Hospitals, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the US, the Department of Health and Human Services, and Kaiser Permanente. Following 20 years or more of hands-on experience in health policy, Robin returned to graduate training at the University of California School of Public Health, where she earned her PhD in health services and policy. Since obtaining her doctorate, Robin has served on the faculty of the School of Public Health, where she teaches both basic and advanced undergraduate course in healthcare policy. Her teaching has earned her the School of Public Health Excellence in Teaching Award. Robin also mentors many undergraduate and graduate students who are conducting research in healthcare policy. Robin has a passion for advocating for accessible, affordable, and quality health insurance. She, for all Americans, she shares this passion with her students. And in the words of most of her students who I've talked to, her teaching and mentoring is simply awesome. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Robin, who will introduce our speaker panel for today. Robin. Thank you, Ken. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, before I get into the first speaker, I just wanted to little, do a little bit of housekeeping. I want to invite you all to submit questions as they come to you. We will have time for one question, maybe more, but probably just one question following each speaker. And then at the end, we will open up for a general Q&A where we can direct your questions to each and every and all each of the three speakers. Um, I also want to let you know that this has been recorded and you will be sent a copy of the recording and we will be asking you again at the end, but I want to ask you to be sure to fill out our post event survey. 
So now I want to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Steve Shortell. Steve Shortell is a Blue Cross of California Distinguished Professor of Health Policy and Management Emeritus, Dean Emeritus, and Professor of the Graduate School at the School of Public Health and Haas School of Business at University of California, Berkeley, where he is the founding director of the Center of Healthcare Organization and Innovation Research, CHOIR, and co-director of the Center for Lean Engagement Research and Research, CLEAR, in healthcare. Dr. Shortell has authored or co-authored over 350 peer-reviewed articles and 10 books. He and his colleagues have received numerous awards for their research, including the Baxter Allegiance Prize for Innovative Contributions to Health Services, the Gold Medal Award from the American College of Healthcare Executives, the Distinguished Scholar Award from Academy Health, and the AHAHRET Trust Visionary Leadership Award, Award among others. His research examines the formation and performance of integrated delivery systems, the organizational factors associated with quality and outcomes of care, and the factors that influence the adoption of evidence-based processes for treating patients with chronic illness. He is currently conducting research on patient engagement, the performance of accountable care organizations, and on lean management applications. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and serves as an advisor to many organizations committed to improving health and health care in the United States. And he is a, my professor and my mentor. <laughs> so without further ado, I want to introduce Steve Chartel. Thank you, Robin, very much. You've had a lot to overcome, I think, but you've done it beautifully. I just want to add my welcome to uh, all of you participating in our session today. I'm kind of going to be the uh, warm up act, if you will, for uh, Mayor Steinberg and Professor Scheffler, who will go into a little bit more uh, detail on some of what I'm going to set up. We thought we would start just by kind of assessing how healthy are we really here in California and some of the factors behind that. And then we'll do a little bit of deeper dive on some of the mental health issues that uh, Mayor Steinberg will, will address. And then Professor Scheffler will get into some of the cost components and so on. And perhaps depending on your interest, uh, others in this series, we can go into even more depth on, on other topics. So if we have the first slide, as you can see here, California Healthcare Today, how healthy are we really? And if we go to the next slide, I wanna kind of ground us, if you will, in what the determinants of health really are. And as you can see here, 40% of it is our own behavior, what we do every day, our diet, uh, our sleep, which has become increasingly important, and of course, exercise above all. I suppose you could say that you can't get enough of the sleep and uh, exercise, and on the other hand, on the diet, less is better, right? Uh, so there's you know, some, uh, uh, some ways in which those are really curvilinear, but we can talk about that. 30% is our genetics, 20% our environment, and only about 10% really is the healthcare system as such, although often that's what we tend to focus on. So I just want to establish this as the baseline for some of the data that I'm going to be showing us as we go ahead. If we go to the next slide, what you will see on this slide is overall health rankings that come from America's Health Rankings Annual Report. These are very current data. And what it shows is overall in California, we're doing fairly well. We're not in the top 10, as you can see here. Vermont, Massachusetts, Hawaii are the top states. We're second as you begin to divide up the health rankings on individual healthy behavior. We do pretty well on various measures they have of clinical quality of care, such as risk-adjusted mortality and morbidity. But where we really fall down is in that community and environmental factors. Just think here in Northern California, how many spare the air days we've had. And of course, we've had the fires and so forth. So this is an area that we don't rank very well at all. If you now, as we'll begin to drill down to the next slide, what you will see on this slide is to take into account the low income communities in our state. Because what I wanna tee up is everything I'm gonna show from here on out will be global overall. We don't have time today to show the differences for people of color and disadvantaged populations in the state. 
but I'm gonna show you, think of it two times, four times worse for our African-American residents, for a Hispanic, for many of our Asian Americans as well, American Native Indian, Pacific Islanders, okay? So these here, as you can see, 20% live in poverty. And it's not just income. What we've done here is adjust for cost of living in the social safety net, because you might make a good income, but if you're in a very expensive area, you're living in San Francisco, for example, you may not be able to afford you know, rent for your apartment. And on the other hand, you may have a low income, but if it's a low income area in terms of cost of living, you may not be so bad off. So it is adjusted for that and also the availability of services. So having said that, you see 26% Latino, African-American disproportionate and so on. So the next slide, if we move to that, here's the percent uninsured in our state. 2009, before Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, it was about 14, 15%. We made great inroads, dropping it to 7%. And the goal now in 2022, as the Biden administration begins to open up some of the subsidies, is to try to get down to 5%. But here in California, a large part of that is undocumented that won't be affected by the subsidies. These data, by the way, come from uh, Get Healthy California, which was an initiative in the Brown administration, and it's carried on as well. We can give you further citations uh, if you want them. The next slide will show our overall self-reported health status. This is the percentage of people to surveys in California. Their health is good or excellent. Okay, 51% dropped down. The target for 2022 is to get that back up to 60%. The next slide will show the infant mortality rate in our state per 1,000 births. And as you can see here, we're beginning to go in the right direction. We're aiming to get that down to four per 1,000. There's initiatives in the state to improve maternal and child health care, which will help with that. The next slide is the body mass index related to obesity, the circumference relative to our height and body type, et cetera. Here, one of the numbers a little bit off, but here you can see the cost to the state, $82 billion uh, by 2030. If we can make inroads on that and a ambitious goal of trying to get it down to 11% uh, by 2022. The next slide, will show diabetes. And again, here we have the highest number of new cases per 100 people in the nation, 32% increase in the state over the past 10 years. A big challenge to get that down. The next slide will get us into depression and Mayor Steinberg will drill down on some of this on mental health. Uh, in the time I had data available, that's the goal for 2022 is still under development. COVID-19 is certainly contributing to this. The next slide will look at preventable hospitalizations. These should not occur. We're going in the right direction. These should never, these people should end up in the hospital if we have good primary care and access to care. And the next slide, we'll look at unplanned readmissions due to disruptions in care. Again, we're trying to get that down to 11.9%, lack of continuity and coordination of care between inpatient and outpatient. Hospital acquired, the next slide is hospital acquired infections. Okay, again, we have a, a ways to go there as well. This is per 1000 discharges, sepsis being one example. The next slide, the next to last slide that I have, we've been doing work here at Berkeley, our School of Public Health initiated the Right Care Initiative 12 years ago. It's now up and down the state. Uh, we did intensive uh, interventions in San Diego with University of Best Practices, monthly meetings of physicians and others, putting pharmacists on the care team. And you can see that red line driving that down, statistically significant. These are examples of the kinds of interventions we're capable of in California. And finally, I wanna wrap up by saying on the next slide, we have unrealized potential. We're doing pretty good, we can do better. My favorite uh, author, one of them is Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better than try to do better. We can do better. Robin, back to you and Ken. Steve, thank you for an excellent overview of, of some of the um, issues facing California. In particular, uh, looking at your determinants of health slide, it shows that about 40% of our health is behavioral based. 
And from your presentation, it seems that both obesity and diabetes are clearly going in the wrong direction and leading California, as you point out, to have the highest number of new cases of diabetes in the nation. So if behavior is an important player in the onset of diabetes, what can be done to modify behavior and reverse this trend? Yeah, it's no one thing, Ken. Thanks for that question. I know it affects a lot of us. It's no one thing as a portfolio of things. There's no magic bullet to almost any of these here, but I'll give a few examples. One is, you know, in terms of prevention, for example, tax on sugar drinks, right? We've done that in Berkeley, a few other parts of the, of the state. So making it more difficult, much more difficult to do things that are harmful to our behavior and easier to do the right thing. So that's just on on the diet side. Uh, obviously the community environment uh, is a big factor here as well. If you have availability of healthy foods and many in our low income communities do not, they're called food deserts or food swamps, for example, is another factor. So you need to work at it on the policy side as well as you know, interventions you know, on the ground as well. And I think we realize that, the state health department realizes that, but it's really cross sector. The educational sector, the community development sector needs to get involved in addition to the health sector. Prevention's a big part. Prevention's a big part of this and having the data predictive analytics to target to those populations that do need assistance and making it difficult to do the wrong thing and easier to do the right thing. Great, thank you. I think we'll turn it back now over to Robin to uh, introduce Mayor Steinberg, Robin. Thank you, Stephen. That's a great um, um, platform for starting off today's discussion. I am pleased to introduce now Mayor Daryl Steinberg. Daryl Steinberg has a long track record as a public servant. He started as the founder and first president of the Tahoe Park Neighborhood Association. He was later elected to the city council, then to the California Assembly, and then to the state senate. As the Senate leader, Steinberg was known as a builder of coalitions that delivered results, getting, including guiding the state back to fiscal solvency during the economic downturn. Over his career, Mayor Steinberg championed economic development, education reform, building sustainable communities, and major investments in healthcare and education. And central to today's talk, Mayor Steinberg authored the Mental Health Services Act the first of its kind in the nation that generates $2 billion a year for people in need. As mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg secured resources to tackle difficult problems such as homelessness and economic inequity. He was as instrumental in getting a new one cent tax passed in order to invest in economic development, youth and affordable housing. Daryl is a graduate of UCLA and UC Davis Law School. Mayor Steinberg, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you to Ken. Thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this very important discussion. Uh, I'm a proud alumna of UC Berkeley Go Bears. And uh, I, I was happy to get this invitation and spend a few moments with you. I know you're tackling uh, some, some vital and broad topics today. And my part is to uh, talk about mental health and talk about behavioral health, and talk about brain health, which is an issue that has changed in terms of its focus and attention over the 30 years that I have been involved in public life. For a long, long time, we have acted as if the brain is not an organ of the body. We have treated mental health very differently than, than physical health. Think about all of the ways where we have set aside and treated the brain and brain health and mental health differently than physical health. Think about what happens when someone suffers a psychiatric emergency and is rushed to the hospital, usually in a police car, and how they often have to wait 24 to 48 hours or more 
to potentially get a hospital bed, many instances discharged without any follow-up care, without getting a hospital bed. In contrast with what happens that with what happens when, God forbid, you suffer from a heart condition or a heart attack. The minute you rush to that hospital, you have the right kind of care and a bed to ensure that that physical condition, that heart condition is taken care of and addressed. Think about what would happen if you were walking down the street of any California city and you saw someone with suffering from a broken arm or a broken leg who, who looked or acted like you do. You would stop and you would ask them if they needed help as they were suffering from whatever intense physical, physical pain they were suffering from. And then think about the people who we pass by every day on our streets, who are in obvious psychiatric distress, who we don't seem to have any answer for in too many cases. And then think about what has happened over the course of many decades around the once life ending diagnoses around most cancers. Now it's true that cancers, some cancers continue to be fatal and people, too many people still die of cancer every year. But over the last 30 or 40 years, because of public attention, because we have deliberately busted the stigma, because of more money for research and more care for patients, Many cancers have moved from a stage four diagnosis to a stage one or two diagnosis. Saving lives and giving people more hope for a longer life. We have a mental health system in our society, in our state and in our country that despite all of the advances we have made over 30 or 40 years, is still largely a stage three or four system. If you want to get help, you've got to suffer some form of life altering uh, incident that either lands you in jail on the streets in an emergency room too often before your issues are addressed. And so just as cancer was forbidden, if you will, to talk about many decades ago. And we changed that. So do we now in 2021 and going forward have an opportunity to not only transform what is still too often considered and is in fact a broken mental health system, but we have the opportunity to elevate mental health as the public health and public policy priority that it must be. And why do I have some hope? I have some hope because at the national level and certainly at the state level, policymakers are beginning to pay more attention to the issues of mental health than ever before. When I was in the legislature as a young man back in uh, the day I started in 1998, you could hardly get a member of the legislature to carry a bill to improve the system. You could never imagine a governor using his state of the state address to talk about improving and fixing the mental health system. Fast forward now, uh, all of these years later, 24 years later, Governor Newsom devotes his entire State of the State address in 2020 before the pandemic to homelessness and mental health. More legislators are carrying bills on this topic than ever before. There is beginning, there is the beginning of a recognition that while money is important and relevant to address issues like homelessness and to provide help to people earlier so that they don't fall through the proverbial cracks, 
that it isn't just about money anymore. It's about systems change. It's about acknowledging the reality that in our state, we arguably have at least five separate and distinct mental health systems that don't talk to one another. You've got private pay, private commercial pay. You have Medicaid, Medi-Cal managed care. You've got the public mental health system like the Mental Health Services Act, $2.4 billion a year being generated to save a lot of lives and save and fill a lot of gaps. You have school-based mental health uh, programs and care, and you've got prisons and jails. It's at least five different systems, but they're not integrated. And far too often people don't know how to access the front door. And whether it's through Medicaid reform, through the administration's CalAIM proposal to allow the Medicaid dollar to be spent on whatever it takes, whether it's the parity bill that we, the legislature passed year, last year with the strong support of our institute and a lot of advocates to require insurance companies to cover more prevention and early intervention to cover eating disorders, to cover substance abuse, whether it's seeing those pub precious public dollars, not as the not, not as the dollar to fill so much unmet need, but to actually catalyze um, the other systems to be able to do more with, with their dollars. Um, we have the chance now, if we do it right, to build a single system that doesn't matter to the individual whether or not they are covered under Medicaid, whether they take advantage of the public system, whether or not they have private health insurance, but they know they're gonna be able to get the care they need early before they suffer more than anybody should have to suffer. We also have a significant problem in the mental health field around the lack of a, a trained and qualified workforce. In some counties, there are very few child psychiatrists. There are not enough social workers. There are not enough therapists. And certainly one of the pathways must be to do what we did when we lived with the nursing shortage 20 plus years ago. And that is to invest more resources in our community colleges, in our college programs, in our, uh, in our technical trade schools to create a more robust mental health workforce. And we have to be creative. We have to be creating career pathways for the college students who want to get eventually get their MSWs or their MFTs and give them the training now so that they can go into the high schools and the middle schools and provide those supports to the kids who are coming back to school after all of this time um, who, who are suffering because of the isolation and because of what the trauma that they, that they have, have gone through. We need to train more people I call it democratizing the mental health provider movement. We can all be providers, whether it's mental health first aid, whether it is more intensive training, whether it's learning how to be a better friend to somebody who is, who is suffering and how to understand the signs of serious depression or mood disorder or, or even schizophrenia and to help navigate for a friend or a loved one how to get the help and care they need and deserve. For the first time in my memory, we actually have more resources dedicated to these problems than we have ever had before. The real challenge and the real opportunity is to once and for all, remove that stigma that still exists that still makes it difficult for someone living with depression or mood disorder to come back to work after living through an illness and to be able to talk freely and openly about what it is they're dealing with. In the same way 
that somebody who suffers from diabetes or heart disease doesn't hesitate to tell a coworker what they've been through. This is our moment, um, whether it's COVID, whether it is the, uh, the fact that everybody knows somebody, that more people are talking about these sets of issues now, or whether it is the most serious manifestation of untreated mental illness, the homeless crisis, that has gotten the attention of all Californians. Now is the time to make mental health the centerpiece of our public health priorities in California and in the country. We've come a long, long way, but we're not quite there yet. Until people stop referring to the mental health system as the broken mental health system based on more positive experiences and based on, based on common sense improvements that increase the numbers of people who are trained to provide help, better uses of telehealth, and easier access to early care. Until we, we get to that point, we have a lot more work to do. Thank you for having me. I'm, I, I know I didn't talk in any detail about homelessness, which I'm happy to do, if that's of interest to the panel. But I just appreciate the focus today and the opportunity to talk about what I refer to as the unattended to issue of our time. And that is uh, the issues of the brain, nothing to be afraid of, everything to strive for, People should not suffer as much as they suffer in our society. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Steinberg. And it, 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 I think we're all, this audience, and we're all very interested in the mental health challenge facing this state as well as the country, and particularly with the pandemic, which has increased it tremendously. So you referred, I believe, to Senate Bill 855, which went into effect uh, on January 1st and broadens the um, health care service plan insurers obligations to insure people for behavioral health coverage. Um, some of the questions that have stemmed up is, uh, do we have enough mental health providers to meet what is anticipated to be an enormous demand on mental health services? And if we don't have enough mental health providers, could you share with us some of your ideas of how we can increase the number of providers to meet this urgent demand? Sure. I, I, I did touch on this, but let me go into a little bit more detail. I, I use this term again. We have to democratize the mental health provider movement. More people need to become providers. Not everyone has to be licensed. You know, there's a huge peer movement that's going on in the country and state. People with lived experience are some of the most effective providers because they can relate to the person who is suffering in the moment. So last year for the first time, a governor, again, I give credit to Governor Newsom, signed a bill. And I know I this bill was so old, I had authored it back in my day. But it was finally authored and signed by the governor to actually provide Medi-Cal reimbursement for peers. Now, there were compromises because it had to be a county opt-in and, and it's going to take some time to get it off the ground. But for the first time, the system is going to recognize the power of peers and reimburse them for the services they provide. I mentioned earlier, and I believe very strongly as we're suggesting to the administration that it use some of its one-time money to establish essentially a mental health service core focused on college students who are interested in a career pathway in mental health, but who can get the training as part of their college experience and gain work experience by going into the high schools, the middle schools, or even the grammar schools and provide the supports for a lot of kids who, if nothing else, have no one to talk to about what it is they um, are feeling. 
We need to dramatically expand the use of telehealth. I mean, that, that's an obvious one because um, we can be much more efficient with provider time um, by, by tailoring a lot of uh, the mental health services appropriately to telehealth. Now telehealth is not appropriate um, or, or helpful for everybody, especially those who are suffering from more severe conditions, but for a lot of people who just need a little bit of help or, um, uh, or, a, modest, or, or a moderate amount of help, telehealth is an essential part of how we, uh, how we expand the services. And we need to overcome the jurisdictional tensions between schools, counties, and mental health providers so that we can have, so that schools can have the kinds of support networks that the students need without um, it becoming overly bureaucratic. Um, there's no easy, and then we need to invest more in the professional education for licensed staff um, at all levels, psychiatrists, psychologists, and and, uh, and those with master's degrees. So it's, um, it's not one thing, but if mental health is a priority, then we will incentivize the, the training of people who can fill a lot of different voids that exist today. Thank you. And just a, a corollary to that, and I think you, you touched on it, but the, the poor communities are having difficulty with access to healthcare in general, as opposed to the wealthier communities. And would you comment on, is this also represent a challenge in providing a mental health service, both in access for our poor communities in the state versus our better off communities? Well, there's no question about it. Um, you know, those who can afford it can uh, pay out of pocket for their mental health care and treatment. People from lower income communities uh, can't necessarily. And Medi-Cal and Medicaid um, is an entitlement, obviously. But when you don't have enough <laughs> of a provider network and when you don't have culturally competent uh, approaches to, to, to mental health care, you are uh, not providing what people need. I remember in the very early years of the Mental Health Services Act, there was criticism because we used some of the early innovation dollars to establish a community garden in Fresno. And the reason we did that was we were trying to reach out to the Hmong and Mian communities. And the advice we got was that you can't open a sterile clinic and expect that people um, from different cultures um, are going to just walk into what you say is culturally appropriate. And so we invested in the gardens and then brought the therapists and the mental health professionals to the gardens, which was a safe place then for people to access. That's the kind of thinking that we need to always um, uh, put at the forefront because um, client-centered, culturally diverse and culturally competent, focus on prevention and early intervention and, and training a larger, more, more robust, diverse workforce. All of those are the necessary elements to providing care to people who, uh, especially communities that start with significant disadvantages. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question um, uh, that uh, from our uh, audience. And, and the question is, um, what are some ways we address the cultural barriers that are present when seeking mental health? We don't assume that the traditional medical model is, is the right way to provide care to to our diverse communities. I mean, I think my last answer was my answer to the question, which is that um, there's been a lot of work done on what it takes to break down barriers, especially in diverse communities where the stigma around mental health is even stronger. 
And it, number one, it requires a workforce that is diverse. And two, approaches that, you know, we use the term culturally competent, that help to make people feel like you're not doing something to them, but you're helping them in their environment, in their way, uh, be able to deal with whatever is, whatever they are suffering from. Thank you. I think, um, thank you, Mayor Stanford. Uh, Robin, do you want to go on and Thank you. That was that was great. Um, so now I get to introduce another professor and mentor of mine, um, Dr. Richard Scheffler. Dr. Scheffler is a distinguished professor of health economics and public policy at the School of Public Health and the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Scheffler is also the director of the Petra Center of Healthcare Markets and Consumer Welfare. For over three decades, his, re his research has focused on how healthcare markets function and the impact of consolidation on healthcare prices and the affordability of healthcare coverage. He has been a visiting professor at the London School of Economics, Charles University in Prague, at the Department of Economics at the University of Pampua Fabra in Barcelona, and at Carlos III University of Madrid, Spain. Dr. Scheffler has been a visiting scholar at the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation in Bellagio, and the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences and a consultant for the World Bank, the WHO, and the OECD. Professor Scheffler has been a Fulbright Scholar at Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile de Santiago in Chile and at Charles University Prague in the Czech Republic. He was awarded the Chair of Excellence Award at the Carlos III University of Madrid in 2013. In 2015, Dr. Scheffler was awarded the, global, the Gold Medal for Charles University in Prague for his longstanding and continued support of international scientific and educational collaboration. In 2018, he was given the Berkeley Citation among the highest honors the campus bestows on its community presented on behalf of the chancellor to individuals whose contributions to UC Berkeley go beyond the call of duty and whose achievements exceed the standards of excellence in their fields. Dr. Scheffler. Well, thank you, Robin. And uh, before I begin, <clears throat> I want to take my hat off to uh, Maya Steinberg. Uh, for uh, decades, I've been uh, an admirer of him as a person and his work in mental health. Uh, uh, he's thoughtful, he's innovative. Uh, he understands deeply how the system operates and doesn't. And at the end of the day, he knows how to get things done. And uh, that, is a, that is a rare, rare combination. So uh, my hat's off to you, Mayor, Mayor Steinberg. And uh, um, I just can't imagine someone who's been more important in the mental health field in California and the nation as a whole uh, as uh, you have been. So I wanna thank Ken uh, and his colleagues for inviting me. Uh, uh, to the symposia and uh, and Robin for her uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start uh, by um, telling you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you it, and then I'm going to say at the end why it matters. That's the usual formulaic speeches that we give uh, uh, to our students. So first, I'm going to tell you how important healthcare is and how big it is in California. And uh, I'm gonna wow you with my first uh, slide. So if you wanna pay attention, pay attention to the first one, and then you can go leave and get some, something to eat or drink. But uh, this would be enough, I think, to uh, justify listening to it. And then I'm gonna give you uh, some uh, numbers about the growth in spending in California and the California economy. And then I'm gonna highlight one of the major reasons in California, why healthcare has grown so dramatically. And here I'm gonna focus on prices and particular prices, what we call commercial prices. 
These are the uh, prices that the insurance company pays, not Medicare and Medi-Cal. And then at the end, I'm gonna show you a little bit what's happening at the national level and also what's happening importantly in California to try to address these problems. So on the first slide, here's a, a headline and then there's a little math, those people who like to do arithmetic, but uh, uh, the sound bite is, uh, Two of every hundred dollars spent in the U.S. is spent on healthcare in California. Uh, I mean, two out of every dollar spent in our GNP comes from California. You get this by the fact that the, the GDP for the country is 21 trillion, 18 percent of the gross domestic product, or about 3.8 trillion, is on healthcare. And California accounts for about 11% of that. That's $400 billion. And if you do the math, you see it's 0.02. Uh, so uh, two out of every $100 spent in the entire economy, on everything in the economy, is spent on healthcare in California. To give you another metric, to give you an idea of how big the California economy is, here's a list of the, uh, the gross domestic product. This is the total amount of goods and services produced by these countries. And if you look to the left, you'll see California spending is 400 billion. That would put it uh, just over the entire gross domestic product, the entire budget of Ireland. The entire budget of the entire country of Ireland and, and uh, Nigeria and Iran more, more or less is uh, spent in California. So we are huge. We are big. The economy, the healthcare economy in California uh, is uh, awesome. And it's awesome to deal with and it's awesome to address. Okay, next slide, please. Here's a little bit about the growth of the economy. Uh, you can see in the early uh, uh, 90s, uh, California was uh, basically pretty much at the level of the entire country. So this is spending per capita, and the blue is uh, the US and the red is California. Uh, and then uh, you can see uh, going into 2000, uh, we dropped uh, lower than the national average. And most people attribute this uh, to the increase in managed care systems uh, in California, which didn't happen in the rest of the country. Then in about the year 2000, we now, that's over with, we now track. So the, you see the two lines are basically parallel. Uh, and so over this entire period, the annual rate of growth has been 4.9 for the country and 4.6 uh, for California. So pretty close pretty close to the national average. Next slide, please. So without going through the details at the Petra Center, we've done a little forecasting uh, and those people are interested in how I did this forecast, I'd be happy to send you the details, but we have now forecasted the healthcare expenditures for California and we have a forecast of what we expect the, uh, the gross domestic product to look like in California. Uh, and uh, the ratio of one to the other shows you that the forecast going out now is uh, in a few years time, 2025, uh, we will be spending 16.8% of the uh, uh, gross domestic product in California on healthcare. So you can see there was a a drop in the pandemic and then a bump up after that. So things are moving in an upward direction. Next slide, please. So uh, I picked some services here. I promised you I would uh, show you a little bit about uh, prices. So these are commercial prices. And what I've done here is to compare California's commercial prices, which are among the highest in the country. Uh, and I picked three services out. Uh, one is vaginal deliveries without complications. Uh, many of you know who have studied hospitals like Professor Shortell knows that uh, having babies is a, is a big uh, money uh, uh, 
driver in hospitals, and a lot of it is uh, uh, has to do with how well they do. You can see that uh, to deliver a, a baby in uh, California, it's over 11,000 compared to the rest of the country, 7,000. And then I picked a hip or knee replacement. I won't ask how many people on this call have had a hip or a knee replaced. I'm not one of them, but I do know that there's one on, on the screen right now. I won't say who it is, uh, who's had uh, uh, maybe more than one of these. And uh, you can see the difference there. It, it would cost uh, uh, $33,000 in California and 27,000 in the rest of the country. And then uh, simply a colonoscopy, which uh, we all should be getting. And you can see the price difference there as well. So what we know about the California economy is uh, the thing that's driving our expenditures are, in fact, the higher prices uh, in the commercial markets. This, this, this is the market for people who would have uh, health insurance. For example, if you're a UC employee or state employee or, or working at most jobs. Next slide, please. So again, this is work at the, uh, at the Petra Center. Uh, and I took this for a report <clears throat> that we did uh, for the California Healthcare Foundation. So this again is that vaginal delivery that I showed you, but here <clears throat> we look across the state in the year 2016. And on the horizontal line, uh, you see numbers from 750 to 4,250. These are HHIs, or what technically is called Herfindahl indexes. What it basically does is to measure how concentrated the market is, how many big players we have in the market. And so you can see as the market becomes more concentrated, the price goes up uh, from 14,000 to 18,000. So this is uh, hugely important in driving the expenditures. Next slide, please. Uh, Beyond that, the other big trend in healthcare spending has been what we call vertical integration. And here you'll see two lines, one for specialists and one for primary care. And this basically means now that more or less half the doctors in the state of California, their practices are owned by hospitals or hospital systems. And this is causing another great jump in prices as well. Next slide, please. So what's next? First, I'll tell you, and I'll work at the Petra Center, the next set of mergers and mega mergers that are happening, what we call cross markets. These are mergers, not in the same market area, but across markets. Uh, and uh, this is causing another big spike in uh, prices. So our governor has proposed in a trailer bill to his budget, the Office of Healthcare Affordability. It's also a bill, AB 1130. Uh, California Healthcare Quality Affordable Bill uh, that was introduced by Jim Wood. It sets head, uh, head, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> healthcare cost targets and changes for spending. Uh, and, it and it looks at market impacts uh, of purchases and, uh, and also consolidation. At the national level, same, uh, Senator Amy Kavachar has recently introduced the Competition and Antitrust Enforcement Act, which will strengthen anti-competitive uh, practices, not only uh, uh, in California, but across the nation as a whole. Last slide, please. And so more on uh, the affordability uh, bill. This is now working its way through the legislature. Uh, there were hearings uh, last week that passed the Senate. Uh, it got uh, some question, uh, excuse me, it passed the House. It got some questions uh, unanimously, I should say. It, it got some questions on, on the Senate. So that bill is now being worked on to accommodate some of the answers that the, uh, the Senator has. Uh, this office would be established uh, in Oshbed, uh, which is the place where uh, uh, all the data is collected for California. Office of Statewide Health and Planning and Development. And it has a, uh, a board of advisors to recommend cost targets. And uh, the interesting part of this bill, and I'll end on this, it's the first bill of its time that actually uh, has some muscle behind it. The, the, this approach was used 10 years ago in the state of Massachusetts, uh, who did it first. 
uh, and it worked well, except for the last two or three years, and it was voluntary. Uh, and uh, it worked well for a while, but in the last three, three years, it's kind of fallen apart. The bell in California has some muscle to it. So if the targets aren't met by the insurers and the providers um, after a year or two of helping them out, uh, the amount that they exceed the target will be taken away from them and put in a healthcare affordability fund. So if they exceed it, they're not going to collect it anyhow. So this is some real muscle uh, behind this approach, and, and I'm hoping that it, uh, it uh, passes the legislature this year. So let me stop there and uh, ready for questions. Thank you, Richard. And before we go into a prepared question, I have a real quick follow up from a member of our audience saying, what does healthcare spending include? Just medical care or other wellness services? So what's inclusive in that number? Well, it includes health care. I don't know. I don't know what the uh, uh, question meant, but uh, it will include uh, pharmaceuticals and include hospitals, physicians, dentists, uh, uh, some medical uh, devices, for example. So those would be the major categories that's included in health care spending. Thank you. Um, so your figures shows that the U.S. spends about 18 percent of the GDP on health care. And it's often said that this amount of spending is not sustainable. Doesn't healthcare spending create a lot of employment um, and really good paying jobs and new technology? Why, why is this not good for the economy? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I would say uh, we were saying when it was 10% when I first came to Berkeley, that, that was not sustainable. And now it's 18% uh, heading to 20. So I think this sustainability argument is, uh, is a bit flawed. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing, if, if we had a headline that said people are spending more money on houses and cars, no one would be worried about that. Uh, the answer is that people are spending more money on healthcare, but they're not getting good value for it, as Steve Shortell has told us. So. The, the issue is not the amount, but what we're actually getting for it. And the value, of course, of what we really want is a healthy population. Thank you. And thanks to all of our presenters. I, I wanna now move to the general Q&A session of today's um, event. And again, invite those of you um, participating to put your questions into the Q&A um, bar at the bottom of your screen. And I wanna start with, questions about, okay, so what do we do about this? I mean, we, we have access issues when it comes to, you know, chronic illness, we're not doing so great, we're spending a lot of money, mental health access isn't great. So what kind of reforms, I know this is a big question and could be a session unto itself, but what can we do in terms of addressing this that is a system-wide change? And I'm going to move it around all of you to see if you have, I know some of you brought up some, some fixes along the way, but I think some of the questions that's come in from our audience is more about national reform, single payer, and how that may or may not address this. So if we could start with, um, with uh, Mayor Steinberg. I mean, it's a, it's a big question and there isn't a single answer so I'll just say something provocative, which is that um, if you want to, if we want to do a real pilot around single payer, why not start with mental health? I mean, where I, I talked earlier about the tremendous fragmentation between private pay and and Medicaid and and these public systems, I, I think that the that mental health would be a great area to provide um, to provide a single payer system. Um, I think a lot of the plans really want to deal with it, anyways. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you if you if you ask them in in the most honest and candid moment. Um, got to start somewhere. We're not going to have single payer, whether one believes in it or not, you know, as our nation's, uh, as our nation's policy, it's just not happening. So why not start uh, somewhere and, and make that new 
single payer system, again, focused on prevention and early intervention, higher reimbursements to, to the earlier you provide the care. Um, so that's my thought, my provocative idea of the day. Steve? Yeah, I'm happy to build on that. And uh, I'll start by saying we need to begin paying for better care. It's one thing for universal insurance coverage, and hopefully we are working towards that. But as Richard and others have pointed out, that's simply gonna give more Americans access to one of the world's worst performing healthcare systems. The data support that, we haven't gone into that. I'm not talking about the fact that we don't have some of the best trained doctors and equipped hospitals in the world, we do. I'm talking in large part about the way we pay for care fee for service, do away with it, do away with it. Create upfront risk adjusted for illness population health budgets and for mental health, including for everything. As, as the mayor points out, get rid of this mind versus body kind of thing where we're whole people and then create the incentives for providers to redesign care to eliminate unwarranted complexity, errors, rework, et cetera, et cetera, build in quality metrics and create incentives for them in which they earn their surplus to pay nurses more and to reinvest in technology based on the quality of care they're giving and not every piece, everything that they order. So I would start by saying we need a better care plan that actually pays for better care. Richard, can I ask you to weigh in? Oh, sure. Um, I'll, I'll build on what uh, Steve said, and we've been working on some of this together. And as the mayor knows, also, there's a, a commission, uh, the Healthy California Commission, I happen to be on it, who is looking at the single payer plan in California. So we might uh, do something about that in California. You know, we're known to be innovative, and, and so is the governor. And uh, we now have uh, Javier in Washington, so maybe these guys can have a phone call and, um, and uh, figure it out. I don't really know, but uh, let's hope they can. But I think we're going to take some steps in that direction. It could be single payer or it could be some unify, unified formula financing system where all the money gets put in one pot. Uh, single payer is a, kind of a different version of that. But at the end of the day, it's important to where the money comes from. Uh, and that's going to be a big debate. But as Steve pointed out, it's very important in how you spend the money and how you finance it. And uh, single payer, for those people that, who don't uh, know what the term means, uh, and may have had some kids. I have a 29-year-old, I remember, and you know, when he went off to college, uh, you know, the first month I said to him, uh, well, uh, how much did you spend? And he gave me this amount of money and I just, uh, I paid it. I sent him a check. Same thing the next month, except the bill went up the next month. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the fee for service system, whatever you pay. And then when I finally said, you know, your budget is uh, $300 a month, all of a sudden he spent $300 a month. And, you know, that's what we need to do to the healthcare system. We need to put it on a budget that's reasonable, has the right incentives, and uh, will produce the right quality of care that we want. And also, we want to spend the money uh, to deal with the large inequities in the healthcare system uh, that we have and, and spend it in, in communities and for people of color who have really been left out of the system. And as Daryl said, it's not only money that matters, but without money, nothing else matters. And so, uh, you know, uh, we got to get some resources there. Ken, I know you had a question you wanted to follow up with. I have a comment from the audience and then, then a question. The comment was that uh, even though the United States spends more per capita on health care than any of the other um, developed countries, we still have at least 30 million people with no insurance and maybe an equal amount that are underinsured. So that, that figure is is needs to be adjusted in that sense, or we need to think about it in that. So that was just a comment. But the, the question is, um, given the um, current um, 
situation in Washington and, and perhaps within this state regarding the, the force of the lobby, the insurance lobby, the pharma lobby, um, the hospital association lobby and so forth, how are we going to be able to affect change to get single payer or at least universal coverage? What thoughts are that of overcoming these enormous uh, influences on our legislation, our legislators? Open to anyone. I can start off on, on that. I'm sure Richard and Daryl will want to jump in uh, as well. Um, I think what we're beginning to see, um, and Richard and I are part of a group that includes the president of the Pacific Business Group on Health, Elizabeth Mitchell. She represents a lot of those large employers. Uh, and we're also working with a lot of the large insurers as well. And they're beginning to recognize uh, that perhaps we're getting close to a tipping point in this country of not just you know, the sustainability of 18%, but the fact we're not getting value out of that. That's money, if we could stem the growth of that, better spend on education, community development, dealing with the systemic racism, police reform, other kinds of things that are gonna produce health as we started out talking about, right? And so they're beginning to come to the table, Ken, or those of you who uh, are interested in this issue. And they're beginning, we're beginning to see experimentation around bundled payments, for example, out of the federal government, around even private commercial insurers beginning to uh, work with their provider networks under population health budgets. Here in California, we've got the Integrated Healthcare Association that has really good data that shows the insurers in the state that work with provider networks under these capitation where they get a lump sum up front to keep people well, the incentive to keep people well, they outperform the fee for service model. So that is beginning to occur. And it's an empirical question whether that's maybe a glide path ultimately to single payer. I don't think that's the only way to go, but it is, I think, directionally correct in terms of beginning to pay for better care and not just wasting a lot of money that could go to other determinants of health. Maybe I'll follow up with Steve and I'd say, the single quickest way to get this problem handled in California would be to put the mayor in charge of it. And I <laughs> in six months or a year, it would be done. It'll be done. You, no, you know, there you go. It would be done, or you would be done. I'm not sure no, what's probably the, probably the latter. Yes. <laughs> so if anybody could do it, I suspect that uh, you could. So the problem why people don't have insurance, as we all know, is it's too expensive. And uh, I could show you slides that show the rate of increase in health insurance premiums basically go up 50% quicker than the wages, uh, the wage growth. So it becomes more and more impossible for people to pay for health insurance. You know, they might get it on Medi-Cal or they might get it in Medicare or some other public programs. Uh, but basically uh, for the near poor, uh, uh, it's just too expensive for them. And also we have a hard time covering uh, and paying for the undocumented, which are a huge part of the California's uninsured rate. And so the answer to the question is, you simply pass a bill that Daryl could probably still write and say, de facto today, everybody in California has health insurance. That's it, you're covered. How do you think those other countries got that, Ken? They passed a bill for the country saying, everybody who lives in Switzerland or the United Kingdom or Germany has health insurance or Canada, and then they work out the details afterwards. So, you know, it kind of starts at the top. It's a social uh, cause, it's a movement, it's coming and it's coming fast. And uh, whether we get there this year or next, uh, uh, it's gonna happen. And so that's the way you solve the problem by making a big social decision and then you worry about the details later. Steve and I know all the details. Once you make that decision within 24 hours, Steve and I will write something telling you exactly how to do <laughs> after that. I will, I will also point out that despite the political obstacles, single payer has passed the California legislature a number yeah. of times. Yes. And, and, and so given the increasingly 
quote, progressive nature of the state and the legislature and the strong super majorities, um, even if every Democrat doesn't support it, it's got a very good chance to pass, um, you know, in the right way and the right time. Yeah, I think, it, I, I think you're right. Uh, it could pass, but the question is, the big problem is, could, as you, I think you alluded to it, could you actually do it, uh, implement it? And the big problem is we can't implement it without the chunk of money coming from the Medicare program. That's the biggest uh, part of it. And, and of course, that's determined in Washington and how we get it. That's more than a third. And I don't think we can make up a make up the difference in taxes in California to do without Medicare. But there are barriers. I think that's the point. I mean, you can pass a bill and then you know better than I, can you really implement it and, and what the hurdles are. Some people think that a small step in the direction is, is what Biden put out, uh, some kind of public option, which is basically uh, a single payer plan uh, developed by the state uh, to compete with private health insurance companies. But it doesn't try to put private health insurance companies at the moment out of business. They're big and powerful, as you know, uh, and lobbies and the hospitals don't like that either. So uh, there are lots of approaches. So it's not a matter of uh, passing the legislature. It matters for the fact that uh, that we have a real chance to move it forward. And I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's gonna take a big push uh, to do that, but uh, we can set the pathway, we can set the steps, and, and you know we can look at uh, what needs to be done to get it done, and then hope that the politics line up uh, in Washington. But I don't think, my own personal view is it'd be very difficult, if not impossible, for the state of California to do it alone. So given where, where we are with this discussion and the fact that we're hopefully coming out, maybe not coming out of, but this pandemic and this and COVID and what we've all experienced and Mayor Steinberg as being the mayor of a, of a city during this crisis, just wondering if there's any lessons learned, any, will this serve as a catalyst, do you think, to change? Is it a step backward? Is it a step forward? Um, just, you know, what has COVID un, un, unbearn for us? Is that the right word? <laughs> I would say it is, it is certainly heightened the public's awareness and people's awareness of the mental health challenge in, in society. Because one of, you know, the, the cliche has become if COVID is the pandemic, mental health is the epidemic. Mm. And we, we see the statistics, we see increased suicide attempts, young people, we know that there's tremendous amount of suffering out there, whether it's the economic stress, whether it's the social isolation. Um, think about young people whose lives have been so disrupted, who don't get the, the, who don't get the rituals of, 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 of high school and, and being with friends and college students who don't get to that first experience living away from home, all of it. And this is an opportunity. The pandemic is an opportunity. And I would say one other thing, if I might, if I might on homelessness, which only touched on for a moment, the pandemic also taught me, and I think taught us something, that the combination of increased amount of resources through the federal and state government and what I call compelled urgency, these public health orders to get people off the streets out of these squalid encampments with greater urgency, that combination led California to getting more people off the street in a shorter period of time than at any time in recent history, Project Room Key and Project Home Key. So going forward, more money, and of course the federal stimulus, the new infrastructure plan, the state is awash in one-time money, if we can substitute that COVID public health order with some form of right to shelter, right to housing, right to services, compelled urgency around what it takes to get people off the streets into healthier places um, with the services that they need, if we can take that same combination and move it forward in a post COVID world, we've got a chance to do something very significant around unsheltered homelessness. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that, Robin. I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk now about, well, the pandemic hopefully is beginning to diminish. The positivity rates are going down. The vaccines are rolling out, however, haltingly. We will get to herd immunity to some extent. We don't know exactly when. And a lot of people will then begin to think, okay, it's, it's back kind of to normal. No, the lingering epidemic here is what Daryl has said. It's what's done to us psychologically, okay, up here. The memories we're gonna have, the lost opportunities, the implications for our day-to-day -day behavior going forward. That is gonna linger on. And I think the healthcare sector, hopefully the educational sector, the big word here is resilience. And the second word is innovation. I would like to think we're gonna see innovation in steroids. We're gonna really do things differently, not just repeat you know, what we've been doing and just try to do it better. We've got to do some things differently. And Mayor Steinberg has talked about that in terms of the mental health sector, what we've learned that we can do differently going forward. Those of us in the educational sector, I don't need to tell you, Robin or, or Richard, or you know, we've learned that you can do some effective teaching online and hybrid, right? Exactly. The educational sector needs to change. Yes, there's certain things that are better face-to-face, -face, no question about it. It's not either or. Same with our healthcare system, you know? Kaiser Permanente, 60% of the encounters are telehealth and have been for the last couple of years. Not only do we not need as many hospital beds, even post-COVID or the COVID experience, we don't need as many office visits. We need to think differently about what it means to get healthcare. And the best thing is to stay out of the system altogether. Go back to the first couple of slides, everybody here today. Okay, exercise, diet, sleep, the trilogy, exercise, diet, sleep, and to live in homes and communities that help you do that. Well, Robin, I'll, I'll be brief and, uh... Uh, I'm hoping that what we're going to see is uh, a new renaissance for public health, being in the public health school. Uh, but I think the public now has a better understanding about the importance of what public health is all about. And what it basically means that uh, you're not healthy unless the people around you are healthy. It's not only the pandemic, uh, it's gun violence, mental health problems, uh, homelessness and uh, you know do you want your kid to go to school uh, sitting next to somebody who hasn't been vaccinated or for or is carrying a disease because they don't have health insurance you want to work next to somebody uh, or have a drink at a bar next to somebody who doesn't have health care is carrying diseases I think the population now because of the pandemic, understands really what public health is all about. So you want to be healthy, but the only way you're going to be healthy and safe and to go back to the life you had before is to make sure everybody else is healthy as well. And I think that's the message we ought to push. And that's what I'm hoping uh, others will understand and, uh, and, and we can make that happen in California and across the country. Ken, I hear we have a follow-up question. Yeah, so there's a couple questions related to this making um, uh, healthcare available to all Californians, all Americans. Um, <clears throat> one has to relate to the insurance companies and um, what can we do with the insurance companies? How can they be folded into the system so that they're not going to lobby against it? They'll, they'll allow it to happen. I know th that there are models in other countries where insurance plays an important part, but they have universal care. And, and then the other comment is the, uh, that relates to this and, and to the moving forward with some type of universal care or single payer care is the um, lobbying efforts that contribute greatly to the campaign funds, uh, both mm -hmm. for legislators in Washington as well as in the state. And how much is that going to can we overcome that? So we have had a few questions um, to the panel on that. It's open to all, whoever wishes. And this will be our concluding question given. So if we can pull it all together with that, that would be great. Let's start with Daryl Steinberg. 
maybe we should have a separate hour and a half on money and politics. Uh, and I'm in. <laughs> and, and the fact that, that yes, our system, in which our Supreme Court has said that money is speech, means that in one way or another, large corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money um, influencing elections and the political process. And I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon. And so it's always how do you how do you win despite the obstacles? How do you get started? How do you use a moment, a moment of crisis to try to um, change the public policy? That moment hasn't come yet, certainly when it comes to single payer, but I believe that things are changing all the time. Whether it's the fact now that in California that kids of undocumented immigrants have health insurance and a movement to try to expand that to adults. Whether it's that uh, mental health, as we've talked about, is finally having its day. And at least in this state, more resources dedicated to the issues of homelessness and untreated mental illness than ever before. Um, and so, you know, we got to all be in it for the long haul here and look for the moment. I have fewer answers when it comes to the national government. I think President Biden is using every bit of political capital that he has in the time he has, you know, with, I mean, over these next two years before the next midterm elections to try to get as much public investment on his, in as many areas of need as possible. And I think we need to support that and keep going. Thank you, Richard. People don't realize about the healthcare system, and I'm sure you give lectures on this, Robin, in your classes, is that it's basically a for-profit system, uh, and particularly in insurance companies. But I can tell you, when I came to California 40 years ago, most health insurance companies were nonprofit, uh, and the change in that came in the last 20 some odd years. But it's now a huge for-profit business on the stock exchange. And uh, if, you, if you put your 403Bs there, you could have retired uh, at twice what you have in there now. Uh, it, it is just ramping up with money and continues to do so. A single payer plan says, we will have no more health insurance companies at all. That's what a single payer plan means. It means it'll be like Medicare for all. Uh, that is, is, we're up for a fight. When you have that much money and that much power, I think the fight will be uh, totally and completely enormous. The hospitals don't like it either because if, if there's a single payer, uh, that one monopsonist will determine how much money the hospital gets. It will get a budget. Uh, if it's in California, it'll be determined by the state. The hospitals don't like that. They want to bill for whatever they can get. And if you look at hospital budgets now, uh, they are teeming. You can see new buildings going up. Uh, you, you can see palaces being built all over the state. You can see it in, in Venice. You can see it on Avenue in San Francisco with Sutter. Uh, you can see it at Stanford, UCLA. Uh, on beautiful water fountains, great food. I mean, they, and, and, and I, of course, have data in the Petro Center does on what they're sitting in capital. They're sitting with billions and billions of dollars of reserves that they themselves have invested in the stock market. Do you think they're about to give this up for a single player plan? I don't think so. So uh, the significance of moving that uh, is going to be tremendously difficult and uh, it's going to take uh, much more than uh, I think uh, uh, President Biden has in capital or anything else uh, to deal with that. This is one of the cases where I really hope I am wrong, <laughs> but uh, you know, the rational part of me says, uh, you know, this is going to be uh, difficult, but uh, not impossible. Uh, you would have heard the same speech that I made in 1964 when we, in 1965, when we passed the Medicare program. 
So the answer is uh, there are policy windows and opportunities. And uh, uh, I think we're moving towards one uh, that's going to happen reasonably soon. Uh, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful. Steve, as the last speaker, are we moving towards something? Are you hopeful? So a couple of thoughts just to wind up here, Rob, and I forget who said it, uh, but it's the old line about everything seems impossible until it isn't, okay? We have to remind ourselves of that. And I, I think Richard's largely right in terms of the political climate and all the forces uh, against significant change along the lines of the question. Uh, but a couple of thoughts, uh, a ways of how we might approach this. Uh, one, you identify the stakeholders involved, the big insurance companies, the hospitals, and so forth. And you have to really be clever and think creatively about, okay, that's the reality. We have to acknowledge reality of their self-interest and ask ourselves, what's in it for them? How do we reconfigure and think differently about what we want in terms that they might be able to move a little bit in that direction, so to speak? And the second thought is the coalitions. How do we build coalitions? So, you know, and then when you think back, how did Obamacare get passed? Every president for decades did not succeed, okay? We do have the Affordable Care Act, it's been chipped away. He bought them off. He had people, you know, all kinds of deals, gerrymandering, here's what's in it for the drug makers, the pharmaceutical, here's what we'll give to the hospitals, here's what we'll do with the insurance. And he got it done, but it was cobbled together. And a lot of people say it's weak and so, but it wouldn't have happened at all. So maybe there's some lessons there going forward as well. So you do have to ask what's in it for them. How do we build coalitions? Maybe the hospitals and some of the insurers will get together and coalesce against somebody else that doesn't want to play in the game. And the, the final thought I have is you don't want to brush the stakeholders with a broad brush as if they're undifferentiated. There's a lot of variance and heterogeneity within them. Blue Cross Anthem is not the same as Blue Shield, is not the same as Health Net, is not the same as Aetna, is, et cetera, et cetera. United, major player now. United, major player now, right? They've bought a lot of physician groups. Some of them are beginning to say, bring it on, bring on capitated care. We can do well, we'll meet our bottom line with it. We'll argue what in hell that rate should be. We'll argue about how it should be risk adjusted, but bring it on, okay? So there's variance within that that allows you to build coalitions. Thank you. And I note that we're at time and I just wanna thank everybody who's joined us at this conversation reminds me why I love being in this field because every day is something new and students tell me every semester, oh my gosh, this is the best semester to learn about health policy. And I said, yeah, it's been the best semester for 10 years <laughs> now. I mean, so if there's always something happening, there's always change. And I remember why the two of you, my professors and Mayor Steinberg, I look at you with your um, optimism and your constant, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And I want to be like you. <laughs> I hope to maintain that optimism and I hope we all get that. So to the panelists, I want to thank you all for being here and sharing your wisdom and your experience. To our participants, thank you for your great questions, both prior to today and during today's um, conversation. Um, thank you, Ken, as my co-moderator. And I want to send a special thank you to the staff of ETS and to Sigrid Mueller. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. Um, please, everyone who's listening, please fill out the post event survey and stay tuned for our future events. We, we look forward to getting ideas from you and working out to um, having other conversations in the future. Bye, everyone.